won't be able to give away a few hours later, that he might even have to pay a trash man to haul away. Some people will organize their entire week around their favorite news program, or better yet, they'll keep C-SPAN running constantly, lest they miss something. But there's no future uh, for all that television programming and reruns or syndication. From the who knows how many millions of tweets twittered around the world last week, not the echo of the faintest peep will ever be heard again. We human beings are avid, nay, we are ravenous for news, as we call it. But news generally has a very short shelf life. It gets stale quickly. For many of us, that's the way Christianity appears, as old news. We're confident that we've heard it all already. We know all about it. There's not anything new there for us. And so it no longer interests us. And yet there's this difference between Christianity and old news. Old news may be an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, but that doesn't make it false or untrue, just dated unworthy of our continuing interest. Yesterday's headlines occasionally turn out to be off target, will allow, but we generally, for the most part, believe them to be true, if also somewhat eclipsed by subsequent events. Regarding Christianity, on the other hand, we are often tempted to think that, in fact, nothing really happened, that the Gospels those things, those documents that Christians understood to be announcing good news, that the Gospels are not really a news report, but call them a fairy tale, a once upon a time story. What we'd like to do this afternoon is to consider the possibility that we haven't heard it all before, that we don't know as much as we might suppose we know about the Christian thing, and that it might just possibly be about something that really did happen and does happen and continues to happen. To that end, we've invited two people who I think we could say have staked their lives on that very possibility. Our first speaker is Father Sidney Griffith, a native of Gaithersburg, Maryland. He's an ordinary professor in the Department of Semitics at the Catholic University of America. He was ordained a priest of the Missionary Servants of the Most Holy Trinity in 1965, and he joined the faculty at CUA in 1977. His research interests include Syriac monasticism, Christian theology in Arabic, the history of Muslim-Christian relations in the early Islamic period, and the nature of ecumenical and interfaith dialogue. His books include Faith Adoring the Mystery, Reading the Bible with St. Ephraim the Syrian, and most recently, The Church in the Shadow of the Mosque, Christians and Muslims in the World of Islam, published by Princeton University Press in 2007, and winner in 2008, of the Albert C. Outler Prize from the American Society of Church History. Please join me in welcoming then Father Sidney Griffith. Thank you very much, John, for that wonderful introduction. And I hope it doesn't suggest to people that they're about to get more than I can deliver. The topic I've been asked to address this afternoon is the historical value of the Gospels, knowledge through witnesses. And I must confess that if I had to write some thoughts on that topic before having read the book by Luigi Giussani, which the organizers so kindly sent to me, I would very probably have been reading a different talk. 
At the beginning of the solemn proclamation of the gospel at the Holy Liturgy, the priest or deacon announces a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and the congregation responds with the doxology, Glory to you, O Lord. And at the end of the reading, the congregation replies, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The exchange highlights two important moments that I would like to explore in connection with my topic. The first one, the historical value of the Gospels. And the first moment is that the proclaimed text expresses the testimony of the evangelist to the good news. And the second is that the good news is that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The formula, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to an evangelist, calls our attention to the fact that the texts traditionally attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have been accepted into the canon of the Holy Scriptures because they express the testimony of apostolic witnesses. As the father of church history, Eusebius of Caesarea, called them, they are the holy quartet of the Gospels. They record the testimony of those who, like Matthias, the one who took the place of Judas among the twelve, were among the men who, Peter said, had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And you recognize the quotation from the Acts of the Apostles. According to tradition, Matthew wrote in Hebrew initially, and his text was later translated into Greek. Mark was a follower of Peter, and he wrote to preserve Peter's experience. Luke, a companion of the Apostle Paul, put Paul's preaching into writing, and John, the last to write, recorded his own preaching within the context of his testimony to the glory of the Lord he saw manifest in Jesus of Nazareth. The point to note here is that in each instance, the evangelist's purpose is to record testimony. Luke put the evangelist's purpose clearly at the very beginning of the gospel attributed to him. He said, quote, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. Luke 1, verse 1. At the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, this same Luke remarked, quote, in the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And John, at the very end of the gospel attributed to him, said of himself, this is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did, every one of them to be written. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The end of the quotation. In modern times, as scholars have wrestled with the question of the historical value of the Gospels, my topic, they have come ultimately to recognize that one might distinguish at least three levels of approach. The level of the evangelists and those who subsequently edited, transmitted, translated their texts down through the ages. Then there's the level of the apostles whose memories, preaching, testimonies, 
the evangelists have recorded. And then there's the level of Jesus himself, in whose company the apostles remembered his words and witnessed his deeds and recognized in them the actions of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob performed in their very midst in the person of his son. For the most part, the efforts of scholars have been concerned with what they have called the quest for the historical Jesus, and in more recent times, in connection with what they could confidently speak of as the ipsissima verba Jesu. Their historical critical method has operated on the basis of a hermeneutic of suspicion often, and it has yielded many important insights. But it has also obscured an important and an obvious dimension of the gospel narratives, namely their role as texts in the transmission of a continuous history of human experience. Testimony began orally, presumably originally already in the daily language of Jesus and his apostles and disciples, the Galilean dialect of Aramaic in which they normally interacted with one another and with their contemporaries. The memory of this phenomenon is actually kept in the palpably human story of Peter's frightened denial of his discipleship when confronted by a maid during Jesus' passion when she and the bystanders accused him of being a Galilean. Quote, for your accent betrays you. The end of the quotation. This was in all likelihood the Hebrew, or rather the Aramaic, in which some in the early church thought Matthew had first written his gospel. Aramaic was the daily language of the Jews of that time and later, while Hebrew, strictly speaking, was the language of the Torah and the prophets, whose words Jesus' apostles and disciples continued to use in speaking of him, namely of Jesus himself. And because by their time, the Torah and the prophets had already been translated into Greek for almost 200 years, the common language of the scriptures in the world beyond the Holy Land, it was not long before the liturgically structured kerygma of the apostles and disciples was circulating in Greek. Really, their original language as texts, scriptures. It was this language that gave them entree to the wider world from which they have been translated over the centuries into Syriac, Latin, the languages that would carry them east and west to the brink of the modern world and their subsequent translation into almost every dialect and language on the planet. While the Gospels are now most often studied as texts, they have in fact most importantly been heard in Christian communities orally proclaimed as person-to-person -person testimonies translated, transmitted through many languages, testimonies to whom the apostles and evangelists perceived Jesus of Nazareth truly to be, testimony unmistakably clear to ears steeped in the language and lure of the Torah and the prophets. This is their historical value, I think, through the personal empathy of faith, as I think of it, one can share the apostles and disciples' growing excitement. One can still share that growing excitement of recognition that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This personal empathy of faith is a theme echoed already constantly in the Torah and the prophets, testifying to how the faith in the one God, creator of all that is, is empathetically transmitted from person to person. There, one finds it expressed in the very way in which the covenant people speak of the one God who has elected them and chosen them for his own. They speak constantly of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the very language God himself uses in his exchange with Moses at the burning bush. When Moses asked for his name, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he, God said, 
Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered through all generations. You recognize the quotation from the book of Exodus. It would be hard to miss the person-to-person -person aspect of this exchange, as well as the empathy of faith in recognition of the one God that every Israelite would immediately have through the scriptural recall of the personal experience of his father Abraham. Christians too, who would St. Paul recognize Abraham as their father in faith, have instant empathy with the faith of those who recall with St. John the Evangelist that Jesus of Nazareth once said, before Abraham was, I am. It is the empathy of recognition of who Jesus really is, clearly expressed in the idiom of ancient Israel. It's an empathy that one has through the words of the evangelist with the faith experience of the apostle. As Monsignor Luigi Giussani has so evoca evocatively expressed it in his book, At the Origin of the Christian Claim, and remember, I as an outsider have just read this book, the Gospels transmit the recollection of the growth experience by which Jesus' apostles and disciples gradually came through the many vicissitudes of their companionship with him, eventually to recognize his true identity. The evangelist's words encode the memory of this experience in narratives that enable the latter-day audience who hears or reads them to experience the empathy of faith with Jesus' original apostles and disciples through the power of the Holy Spirit who enlivens the words. This same power enables the experience to be transmitted even through the transition of the words from oral to written, from Aramaic to Greek to Latin to every human language. Not only that, but the power to evoke empathy with the faith experience of the apostles and disciples in Jesus, the Son of the living God, persists even through the obstacles of textual transmission, scribal errors, even occasional deliberate distortions of the wording, not to mention the innumerable constructions commentators, ancient and modern, have put upon the evangelist texts in pursuit often of their own interests. The historical value of the Gospels remains their uncanny potential in an idiom that readily echoes the God words of the Torah and the prophets to lead the mind of man to the recognition that in Jesus of Nazareth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did indeed walk this earth incarnate from the womb of Mary. In reference to the gospel's testimony to the experience of this recognition on the part of Jesus' apostles and disciples, Giussani called it, quote, an itinerary of conviction through a series of repeated recognitions. The end of the quotation. I think that's a beautiful sentence and it's one that inspired my thought that it's precisely here that we find the historical value of the Gospels. It was Saint Ephraim the Syrian, a man who lived in the fourth century, who in his beautiful Hymns on Paradise calls attention to the power of the scriptures. The word of God in the words of men. We should never forget they are in the words of men like us to lead the mind to paradise. On the occasion of hearing the gospel passage read in the liturgy in which the crucified Jesus says to the good thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. Ephraim says, that he, Ephraim, went straight away to the book of Genesis to learn of paradise. And 
Here's where he uttered the following words, which I think are applicable to us and our encounter with the Gospels as we hear them in the liturgy, as we read them in silent prayer. Beautiful words that I think express the meaning of Lexio Divina in an incredibly beautiful way. Ephraim says, I read the opening of this book and was filled with joy for its verses and lines spread out their arms to welcome me. The first rushed out and kissed me and led me on to its companion. And when I reached that verse, wherein is written the story of paradise, it lifted me up and transported me from the bosom of the book to the very bosom of paradise. The eye and the mind traveled over the lines as over a bridge and entered together the story of paradise. The eye, as it read, transported the mind. In return, the mind then gave the eye rest from its reading. For when the book had been read, the eye had rest, but the mind was engaged. Both the bridge and the gate of paradise did I find in this book. I crossed over and entered. My eye remained outside, but my mind entered within. I began to wander amid things indescribable. This is a luminous height, clear, lofty, and fair. Scripture named it Eden, the summit of all blessings. The lines of Genesis led Ephraim into the bosom of paradise. The gospel verses of the evangelists lead us, the sincere seekers of our day, through the empathy with the experience of the apostles and disciples they record to the recognition of the Son of God. Amen. Our next speaker is Father Julian Caron, who hails from Navajo, pardon my pronunciation. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> A village halfway between, between Madrid and the deep blue sea. After his ordination in 1975, he went on to earn a doctorate in scriptural theology in 1984 from the Theological Faculty of Northern Spain. Actually, somewhere thereafter, he visited a Catholic University and spent a year there. He subsequently joined the Theological Faculty of the Universidad San Tomaso, where he was promoted to ordinary professor. During this period, he published numerous scholarly articles and a book entitled, again, excuse me, El Messias Manifestado. He also served during his time as director, among a great many other things, of uh, the class, Institute of Classical and Oriental Philology, San Justino, and of two journals, the Spanish edition of the International Theological Re Review, Comunio, and Estudios Biblicos. Father Caron moved to Milan in September 2004, having been asked by Father Luigi Giussani to share responsibility for the governance of communion and liberation, an ecclesiastical movement Father Giussani had founded, as it happened, exactly five decades earlier. After Father Giussani's death on February 22, 2005, Father Caron became president of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation. Since 2004, he has also regularly taught Introduction to Theology at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan. In 2008, Pope Benedict appointed Father Caron consultor to the Pontifical Council for the Laity. That same year, the Holy Father invited him to address the General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the Word of God in the Life and Mission of the Church. Let's please welcome Father Caron.
थैंक यू वेरी मच अ चैलेंज फॉर मंथ टुडे कैन अ कल्चर मैन अ यूरोपियन ऑफ आवर डे बिलीव रियली बिलीव इन द डिविनिटी ऑफ द सन ऑफ गॉड जीसस क्राइस्ट This phrase of Dostoevsky that you see quotes on this book sums up the challenge before which faith in Jesus Christ finds itself today. The crucial aspect of Russian writer's question lies in his reference to a precise context. the present day and is addressed to a concrete type of man a culturally formed individual one who does not relinquish the use of his reason in all its power and in all its demands of for freedom and in all its affective capacity in other words a man who does not renounce anything of his humanity a man who has behind him a cultural history a demanding heritage who is under the influence of a pervasive rationalism a spontaneous trust in scientific method and a suspicion of everything that does not submit to reason as a measure. For a type of man with these characteristics, is it possible today to believe in what Christ said of himself? In other words, has the faith some hope of taking root, that is to say, of fascinating, of attracting, of convincing the men of our time? In a conference held in 1996, the then Cardinal Ratzinger replied to this question affirming that faith can still be successful because it corresponds to man's nature. Man has within him a longing and an unquenchable nostalgia for the infinite. With these words, he has also pointing out the condition needed. Christianity needs to encounter the humanity that vibrates in each of us in order to show his whole potential, his whole truth. The book we are presenting is an attempt to explain this approach for answering the inescapable need for reasonableness. Yusane tackles this question right from the preface. He writes, at the origin of the Christian claim is the attempt to define the origin of the faith of Jesus' apostles. In it, I have tried to express the reason why a man can believe in Christ. The profound human and reasonable correspondence between his needs and the event of the man Jesus of Nazareth. I have tried to show the evidence for this reasonableness 
with which we attach ourselves to Christ and there are led by the experience of the encounter with his humanity to the great question about his divinity. So, what is needed in order to make the acknowledgement of the correspondence of Christ to the heart as clear as possible? That is to say, in order for the Christian experience to happen, to a tender and impassioned discovering of myself. The first paragraph of the book reveals at once that Father Giussani is very much aware of the requirements for man to recognize this correspondence. This book offers us the whole methodological genius of his approach. In order for man to be able to grasp fully what Jesus Christ means, he has to stand before him with all his humanity. It would be impossible, he says, to fully grasp the meaning of Jesus Christ without first grasping the nature of the dynamism that makes man human. For Christ presents himself as an answer to what I am. And only an attentive and even tender and impassioned perception of myself can open me up and prepare me to recognize, to admire, to thank, and to live Christ without the awareness of what I am. Even the name of Jesus Christ becomes merely a name. It is hard to find a higher estimation of the person than that offered by Christianity. Christ does not mean to enter secretly into a person's life, as if taking advantage of a distraction. He wants to enter a man's life through the front door, passing through his humanity, a fully conscious humanity made of reason and freedom. Christ submits himself to the scrutiny by man's inborn criterion, his heart. Without this scrutiny, there is no Christian experience. And Christianity wouldn't have chance of succeeding. The American theologian, Reinhard Niebuhr, pointed out the reason clearly. Because nothing is more unbelievable than the answer to a question that is not asked. It was with the heart that the disciples acknowledged Christ. Third, Christianity is a fact. In his life of Jesus, François Moriart describes the first appearance on the world scene of that presence which immediately imposed itself as a form of problem, and since then has had repercussion on history right up to the present. Quote, after 40 days of fasting and contemplation, he came back to the place of baptism. He knew already for what encounter. The Lano Cas says the prophet as he sees him coming. 
surely in a whisper. This time, two of John's disciples were with him. They looked at Jesus, and that look was enough. They followed him to the place where he lived. One of the two was Andrew, Simon's brother, the other John, the son of the Zebedee. Jesus looked at him and loved him. What is written, said Francois Morian, about the rich young man who would go away sad is taken for granted here. What did Jesus do to keep them there? As he saw they were following him, he said to them, what are you looking for? We have read this gospel today. And they answered, Rabbi, where do you live? And he said, come and see. They went and saw where he was living and stayed with him that day. It was about the 10th hour. Let's ask ourselves, how could John and Andrew have been won over so suddenly to the point of acknowledging that they had met the Messiah? Yusana said, there is an apparent disproportion between the extremely simple way it all happened and the certainty of the two. If this first happened, then recognizing that man, who that man was, not in a depth and detail, but in his unique and unparalleled divine value, must have been easy. Why was it easy to recognize him? Because he was exceptional beyond compare. What does exceptional mean? Yusan is asking himself. What can something be defined exceptional when it corresponds adequately to the heart's original expectations, however confused and hazy one's awareness of it may be. It is precisely this exceptionality that, when it happens, reawakens man's original experience, however confused and hazy this awareness of it. So, Thus awakened, he can express a judgment as regards that exceptionality. The most beautiful is a person is easier to recognize this beauty. The most wonderful is a landscape. Easier is recognized its beauty. Is easy. How can we define a phenomenon, a phenomenon like that we have described? Christianity is an event. There is no other word, say you, I need to indicate its nature. Neither the word law, nor the words ideology, concept or plan. Christianity is not a religious doctrine or a series of moral laws or a collection of rights. Christianity is an event, it's a fact. 
all the rest is a consequence. The world event is therefore crucial and it indicates the method chosen and used by God to save man. God was made man in the womb of a 15 or to 17 year old girl named Mary, in the womb where our desire did dwell, as Dante says. The manner in which God entered into relationship with us to save us is an event, not a thought or a religious sentiment, an event. And this is important because it's not only an event at the beginning, uh, along the way, this event lost the characteristics of an event. If it's an event, must continue to be an event. And we think that is the, the nature of Christianity, even if we recognize this nature as an event, is only an event at the beginning. And after, is a set of rules, or a rethis, or a doctrine, but that's, is another thing. And along the way, we can lose Christianity. And this is very important today because in many occasions what we say about Christian is only a kind of reduction apart only a particular part of this event. But a doctrine, a set of rules, a ethics, has not the attractiveness of an encounter. Can't create the empathy about which we have heard before. It's something different. But we think that we know what Christianity is about. But many times, when we talk about Christianity, it's only a reduction of this event. Christ was an event for the disciple. We need to be content reading a book. It's not something that happened today in the same fleshly manner at the beginning. But this is another thing. For this, we need maybe to start to understand what Christianity is about. Because we think, as John said at the beginning, that we know what Christianity is. This, must, this manner that the mystery chose to reach us is that most fitting to man's historical condition. In order to be recognized, to be recognized, God entered man's life as a man with a human form so that man's thought, imagination, and affectivity were in a way blocked or magnetized by him. The Christian event has the form of an encounter, a human encounter in the ordinary day-to-day -day reality. For this encounter, we don't need any preparation. The Christian event does not wait for man to change. 
It does not require preparation or preconditions. It simply breaks in and happens. And when we fall in love, we don't need any kind of precondition. We need only that happens. Thanks to its unique capacity to correspond to the original needs of the heart, his presence is able to reawaken these needs in all their potential, often, often buried beneath a thousand layers of sediment. And to open wide all man's vision, magnetizing all his affectivity. Because it's before the presence of the answer that the question is unleashed in all its boundless depth. This is something what Father Yusani called the overturning of the religious method, the hypothesis that the mystery has penetrated man's existence by speaking to him in human terms, alters the man-destiny relationship, which will no longer be based on human effort the fruit of man's construction or imagination, the study of a distant enigmatic thing or on waiting for something absent. Instead, it will mean coming up against something present. This is the overturning of the method. It is a simple recognition, the reaction of one who, watching out for the arrival of a friend, singles him out in the crowd and greets him. This marks the beginning of an adventure for knowledge, this itinerary, Father Griffith spoke. When we meet a person, says Yusani, who is to be significant in our lives, there is always that first instant when we have a presentiment, when something inside us is almost forced by the evidence of an unavoidable recognition. That's he! or does her. But only time and space dedicated to reiterating this evidence will bolster the existential weight of our initial impression. Only sh sharing life enables this impression to penetrate more and more radically and deeply within us until, at a certain point, it is absolute. From sharing his life, the disciple would emerge a confirmation of that exceptional, different quality that had struck them from the first moment. In, in sharing his life, confirmation grows. The proliferation of signs about his person leads to the reasonable conclusion that I can trust him. This last observation introduces us to the great theme of faith. For the attitude of one who is struck by the Christian event, who recognizes it and adheres to it, is called faith. Essentially, faith, said Yusani, 
is recognizing a presence that is different, recognizing an exceptional divine presence. What is exceptional does not happen normally. And when it happens, one says, this is something quite different. There is a superman power here. This is a new way of looking at reality. This is a new gaze in the way of embracing people. There is a new concern about people. There is a new love. Think of how many times the Samaritan woman has thirsted for the way in which Christ treated her in that instant. Or Zacchaeus, or Mary Magdalene. The Samaritan woman had never been aware of what she had been thirsting for. But when it happened, she recognized it at once. It's easy. Christianity is easy. And if we keep repeating that Christianity is difficult, we don't understand what Christianity is about. Christianity is easy. It's to follow the attractiveness, the exceptionality of somebody because I don't want to lose what I have met is a passion for something, for somebody, for a person that I don't want to lose at all. Faith, understood in this way, is as far removed as can be from belief that is strange from human nature. It implies a journey of awareness that involves reason, affection, and freedom before a fact without compare. Faith, in that sense, is part of the Christian event because it is part of the grace that the event represents, part of what it is. Because in front of that, the beauty of a person, the form of the attractiveness of a person, I am so facilitated to adhere, to adhere them, that it's easy. I can attach myself because of the attractiveness. It's part of the grace, of the presence that I have in front of me that facilitate my freedom to adhere and the reason to recognize. It's easy. Faith belongs to the event because as loving recognition of the presence of something exceptional, it is a gift, it is a grace. Just as Christ gives himself to me in a present event, he brings to life within me the capacity for grasping it and recognizing in exceptionality. This present is so wonderful that open my reason to recognize exceptionality and challenge my freedom. And my freedom accepts that event because it's so correspondent to what I am looking for that it's easy to recognize. How can I know that with faith a year to is true, is real? What is the verification? Our last point. So, what happens? When the Christian event happens to me, we can say, see, briefly, 
my humanity flourishes. Christianity is an event that man happened across and which man discovered himself as Sejusani, the same blood. It is a fact that reveals the eye to itself. When I encountered Christ, I discovered myself a man, said Roman rhetor Marius Victorinus. This is a phrase that describes well what happens when faith is a real experience, not only a doctrine or a set of rules or something else. This exaltation of humanity expresses all the reasonableness of the Christian faith. When you recognize the event of Christ, that is to say, faith, you live everything in a new way. This new and surprising way of living day-to-day -day life proves the truth of the Christian faith. Because Christ exalts reason, Christ exalts affection, Christ exalts freedom. So what reason does faith have? The reason that faith has is that it realizes my humanity with its needs. It improves it and makes it grow. This is the Christ promise, the fulfillment of the Christ promise. Everyone who follows me will have eternal life and the hundredfold on earth. The hundredfold in terms of affection, of reason, and of liberation is reasonableness in the act of faith and constitutes the overcoming of every opposition between Christ divinity and my humanity. In this way, Christ submits himself to verification by our heart. He does not, not ask to be believed unconditionally. This is why the Christian claim is the most imposing challenge a man can find himself facing, because it mobilizes all the resources at our disposition, reason, affection, and freedom, in order to carry out a verification. No one can take our place. Not even Christ did so. Faith, says you, Sani, cannot cheat. It cannot tell you it's like this and win your approval, just like that. No. Faith cannot cheat because in some way it is tied to your experience. In the end, it's as if faith were to appear in court with you as the judge, using the criterion of your experience. But neither can you cheat, because in order to judge it, you have to use it. In order to see whether it transforms your life, you have to live it seriously. Not faith according to your interpretation, but faith as it, as it was handed down to you, the authentic faith. This is why our conception of faith is directly connected with the hour of the day, with the day-to-day -day life as we live it. 
If you fall in love with a girl, said you, Sunny, or have had a few experiences of being in love, I have never perceived how faith changes that relationship. If you have never said to yourself, how faith through life, light in this tentative relationship, how it changes it for the better. If you have never been able to say something of that sort, and instead of the girlfriend, you can put anyone else, father, mother, job, uh, circumstance, whatever. If you have never been able to say, how faith makes my living more human. If you have never been able to say this, then faith will never become conviction, will never become constructive, and will never generate anything because it has not touched the depth of our eye. A year ago, at the presentation of the religious sense, we resolved to leave the religious sense as a verification of faith, trying to answer Father Yusani's apprehension. We, Christians in the modern climate, have been detached, not directly from Christian formulae, not directly from Christian rights, not directly from the laws of the Christian Decalogue, but we have been detached from the human foundation, from the religious sense. We have a faith that is no longer religiosity. We have a faith that no longer answers as it should to religious sentiment. We have a faith that is not aware, a faith that no longer understands itself. In the same way, today, we resolve to go ahead with the same verification by tackling at the origin of the Christian claim. What does this mean? What is the verification that Christ, as a present event, has entered into our life? The fulfilling of humanity, the hundredfold in reason, affection, freedom, we said. This remains in the past, like now, the essential and irrevocable verification of the reasonableness of faith, of the truth of the Christian proposal the evidence of its credibility. But the heart of this verification is through conversion, an increase in faith itself, the loving recognition of his presence. Your presence is better than life. The summit of the verification is the birth of an expectation, of a loving knowledge that grows as the experience of correspondence grows. It is an affection that embraces all other affections. At the heart of the hundredfold, which had been experienced, predominates the deepening of the relationship with Christ, a familiarity, 
a tendency to affirm him and is in recognizing him. It's the Lord, as St. John said. The most profound chain is faith itself. In the ongoing daily encounter with his real presence, our entreaty, our endless thirst, find its answer. And at the same time, it's exalted and broadened. And so recognizing him as the only one able to answer becomes easier and in a certain sense, more inevitable. The direction of our road this year could be summarized with a phrase of St. Paul. But I press on to make it my own since Christ Jesus has made me his own. Christ has made each of us his own. The more Christ has made me his own, the more I am intent in the race to make him my own again. In the long run, what we are pursuing is no longer even a change, that is, our own measure of the hundredfold. Uh, what we are pursuing is his presence, a familiarity with him, a growing in the relationship with him, a relationship with him. This is the case in every loving, relationship that is fully human. Nothing can satisfy but the presence of the loved one. This sets in the world an irreducible figure of man, not satisfied with any what is intermediate objective but always striving forward, attracted by his presence, and therefore a free agent in history, an indomitable rebuilder of ruined houses. Thank you very much. So we want to thank uh, Father Griffith, Father Caron, and Dr. McCarthy very much for that uh, amazing presentation. If uh, you are uh, interested in uh, learning more about this uh, journey that Father Caron is proposing, we invite you to uh, go to uh, the area at the heart of the encounter, which is located on the second floor in the, the center of uh, the balcony area there. There you can uh, learn more about the, the book at the origin of the Christian claim. You can meet people who are uh, on this road, this journey, and you can uh, discuss with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, what they're doing to follow this road. And in five minutes, we will be back in this room uh, for the presentation, William Congdon, Painting to the Depths of Reality a documentary on action painter rediscovered, presented by Jane Malosh, Director, Providence Research Initiative of the Smithsonian Institution. Thank you again, and we'll see you in five minutes.